All right, today we're going to uh, study a little bit, look at what a 33rd degree Freemason, Manley P. Hall, he's kind of like uh, Aleister Crowley, Albert Pike, and Madame Blavatsky. These are very influential people in the world, actually. World leaders study this literature and uh, believe in it. This is basically the Freemasonic literature, okay? So we're going to read some Freemason literature to see what they believe. So we're going to read this book and turn to this chapter, Kabbalistic Keys to the Creation of Man. When the plural and androgynous Hebrew word Elohim was translated into the singular and sexless word God, the opening chapters of Genesis were rendered comparatively meaningless. It may have been feared that had the word been correctly translated as the male and female creative agencies, the Christians would have been justly accused of worshiping a plurality of gods in the face of their repeated claims to monotheism. So we see that the Freemasons worship a plurality of gods. Um, the plural form of the pronouns us and our reveals unmistakably, however, the pantheistic nature of divinity. Further, the androgynous constitution of the Elohim, God, is disclosed in the next verse, where he, referring to God, is said to have created man in his own image, male and female, or more properly, as the division of the sexes had not yet taken place, male slash female this is a death blow to the time-honored concept that God is a masculine potency, as portrayed by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Elohim then order these androgynous beings to be fruitful. Note that neither the masculine nor the feminine principle as yet existed in a separate state. According to the Isarium, the secret doctrine of Israel taught the existence of four atoms each dwelling in one of the four Kabbalistic worlds. The first, or heavenly, Adam dwelt alone in the astolithic sphere and within his nature existed all spiritual and material potentialities. The second Adam resided in the sphere of Briah. Like the first Adam, this being was androgynous and the tenth division of its body, its heel, corresponded to the church of Israel that shall bruise the serpent's head. Well, it's complete nonsense, all right? The third Adam, likewise androgynous, amazing, was clothed in a body of light and abode in the sphere of Yetzirah. The fourth Adam was merely the third Adam after the fall into the sphere of Asiya, at which time the spiritual man took upon himself the animal shell or coat of skins. So there the third Adam is androgynous, all right? The fourth Adam is the third Adam who's come to earth in a coat of skin in a human body, and the demons inhabit the shell. And the shell is, of course, male or female, which they don't like. So they're trying to get back to these uh, three atoms, these three tranny atoms. The fourth atom was still considered as a single individual, though division had taken place within his nature. His androgynous nature, male and female combined, had split in two, two separate genders. And two shells, or two physical bodies, existed. And one of which was incarnated the masculine and the other the feminine potency. This is what they believe. In his recent work, Judaism, George Foote Moore thus describes the proportions of the Adamic man. He was a huge mass that filled the whole world to all the points of the compass. The dust of which his body was formed was gathered from every part of the world or from the site of the future altar. Of greater interest is the notion that man was created androgynous because it is probably a bit of foreign lore adapted to the first pair in Genesis. Our Samuel Bar Naman, 3rd century, said, When God created Adam, he created him facing both ways. Then he sawed him in two and made two backs, one for each figure. Philosophically, Adam may be regarded as representative of the full spiritual nature of man, androgynous and not subject to decay. The word ADM signifies a species or race, and only for lack of proper understanding, Adam been considering it as an individual. So they don't believe Adam was even one dude. It's like a whole race of people, a whole race of trannies. As the macrocosm, Adam is the gigantic androgyne. Adam is the gigantic androgyne. Exactly what is to be inferred by the division of the sexes, as symbolically described in Genesis, 
is a much debated question. That man was primarily androgynous is quite universally conceded, and it is a reasonable presumption that he will ultimately regain this bisexual state. As to the manner in which this should be accomplished, two opinions are advanced. One school of thought affirms that the human soul was actually divided into two parts, male and female, and that man remains an unperfected creature until these parts are reunited through the emotion which man calls love. From this concept has grown the much-abused doctrine of soulmates, who must quest through the ages until the complementary part of each severed soul is discovered. The modern concept of marriage is to a certain degree founded upon this ideal. According to the other school, the so-called division of the sexes resulted from suppression of one pole of the androgynous being in order that the vital energies manifesting through it might be diverted to development of the rational faculties. From this point of view, man is still actually androgynous and spiritually complete, but in the material world, which is kind of where we live, the feminine part of man's nature and the masculine part of woman's nature are quiescent, which means dormant, inactive. Through spiritual unfoldment and knowledge imparted by the mysteries, however, the latent element in each nature is gradually brought into activity and ultimately and ultimately the human being thus regains sexual equilibrium by this theory woman is elevated from the position of being man's errant part to one of complete equality from this point of view marriage is regarded as a, as a companionship in which two complete individualities manifesting opposite polarities are brought into association that each may thereby awaken the qualities latent in the other and thus assist in the attainment of individual completeness. Well, that's celebrity tranny marriage, okay? A tranny couple. The first theory may be said to regard marriage as an end, the second as a means to an end. The deeper schools of philosophy have leaned toward the latter as more adequately acknowledging the infinite potentialities of divine completeness, androgyne, in both aspects of creation. So now the, the serpent speaks and says this, I am the Lord who is against thee and thus accomplishes thy salvation. So they've just turned the devil into God, continues the voice. Thou hast hated me, hated the devil, but through the ages yet to be, thou shalt bless me, for I have led thee out of the sphere of the demiurgus. I have turned thee against the illusion of worldliness, I have weaned thee of desire. I have awakened in thy soul the immortality of which I myself partake. Follow me, O Adam, for I am the way, the life, and the truth. So that's the serpent speaking in, in Gnostic literature. All right, and this is what Freemasons believe. Remember, Freemasons believe that Lucifer is God. That's one example. There's many more examples of Gnostic, Babylonian, Freemasonic literature like this, okay? This is not just a one-off deal. There's lots of stuff uh, about the Freemasons and the uh, power elite of this world and their worship of androgynous gods and their desire to change human beings back into androgynous beings.